Good afternoon. I'm Spot on Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. And today we're going to move into a next lesson in the summer weather video training series. We're going to talk about air pressure and winds. And we talked last week in my training video about uh, motion, uh, energy, whether that be potential or kinetic. Uh, we talked about some of the common atmospheric physics terms such as inertia, acceleration, speed, velocity. And then we also talked about laws of motion from uh, Newton, uh, the first, the second, and third law of motion, as well as some of the energy and the dynamics involved with energy processes. This week, we're going to really take that knowledge from last week and apply it towards weather, in particular, the air pressure and winds, those differences in air pressure and what causes the wind to move from higher to lower pressure, for example. Now, I'm taking this uh, week's slides directly from the Essentials of Meteorology textbook, The Invitation to the Atmosphere 8th Edition by C. Donald Ahrens and Robert Henson. So you will see um, the, the uh, label below from Cengage Learning and we are referencing specifically this textbook. By the way, this is a great textbook. All right, so let's start things off and talk about atmospheric pressure. So you may be watching the news one day and you hear the TV meteorologist talk about the atmospheric pressure or the barometer. And they're going to give you a reading, like 29.92 inches, 30 inches, or whatnot, something like that. Now, air pressure, what is it specifically? It's just simply the mass of air above a given point or level. And one thing to note is, as we get higher and higher in altitude, or higher and higher above the ground, those, the atmospheric pressure is going to decrease due to fewer air molecules being in particular volumes of, of air. Um, so if you're a pilot, for example, you know, as you climb an altitude, you're going to notice that the pressure is going to decrease with height. Now, our atmosphere is highly compressible, and it's a fluid. Most of this is the atmosphere is squeezed closer to the Earth's surface, and that's mainly due to the fact of gravity. Now, this is going to cause the air pressure to decrease with height, and it's going to decrease rather rapidly with height initially, and then as you go higher and higher up, it's going to decrease. The pressure will decrease much more slowly with height. So if you were to take a barometer, for example, let's say you're taking a hike up to a, a higher elevation, a tall mountain peak, and um, you know, you're going hiking, you have your barometer, your little handheld barometer, and you'll, you'll notice as you initially climb that pressure is going to decrease rather rapidly at first. But then as you get higher and higher up, there's fewer and fewer air molecules, um, and therefore the pressure decreases you know, at a slower rate. Now, in the atmosphere, we have what's known as horizontal pressure variations. And you see this on the weather charts in the form of high and low pressure systems. Simply put, a surface high pressure system is an area in which the highest pressure is towards the center of the high of the system itself. In a low pressure system, it's just simply an area of lower atmospheric pressure where you have the lowest reading of pressure towards the center of the low. So we have these pressure variations and they require a shorter column of dense cold air to exert the same pressure as a taller column of less dense warm air. So keep in mind that cold air is dense and warm air is less dense. Now warm air higher up above the ground or aloft, that's normally associated with high atmospheric pressure. And then colder air, higher up or aloft, is associated with low atmospheric pressure. Heating and cooling columns of air, if you heat or cool these columns of air, they, that can establish horizontal variations in air pressure, both above the ground aloft and at the surface itself. So, if we were to look at a, let's say, a really tall building in a city, and um, you, know, you have this, this air column, the higher you go up in that building, let's just say you know, you're going up in that building, there's going to be basically less and less molecules of air as you go higher and higher up and lower pressure as a result towards the top of the building as compared to the ground where you entered. Now this is an example of an air column itself and each one of these little dots represents a, a molecule of, uh, of air. And so you could tell there's differences in the columns of air. Like look at that really tall column that sticks out in the center of this graphic. And then you compare it to these shorter columns 
uh, down there to the left and right of the center taller column, right? So these columns of air vary, and it, it's dependent on the temperature. If I heat the column of air up, the column tends to expand. If I cool that same column of air down, uh, it's going to uh, result in a shorter column of air, more densely packed air molecules. Now looking at comparisons, again, all the columns, and let's say you know, you're near some taller buildings in a city here. Okay, so on the left we have air column one and air column two um, at the same pressure. And then we move to the center where we have a, you know, we cool the column down. We cool column one down, you see how much shorter it got from the, from the graphic on the left. Um, when you cool it down, again, those molecules, those dots that are representing these columns, they become more um, compact or, or closer together in spacing. And that results in a shorter air column because cold air is more dense. But if I heat that air column up um, at the same pressure, keeping the pressure constant, then we're going to have an expansion of air. Heating causes expansion of air, and the air molecules move quicker, and they move further apart. So we have a we have a greater volume basically when we heat that air column. Now look at the graphic on the right, showing um, just general movement. Everything moves from higher toward lower pressure, and we'll get more into that here in a moment. All right, so measuring air pressure, uh, the force exerted by air molecules over a given area or point. How do we measure that? We have something really cool, and I remember the time when I was younger, and I remember I was in, sitting in science class. Uh, I was actually in a high school physics class, and I used to love looking at the barometer that my teacher had up there. It was actually a mercurial liquid barometer, and it, you know, 760 millimeters is the standard atmospheric pressure, but I always loved just to go look at it and, you know, just get close to it, um, because the barometer is such an important instrument. It measures bars. These are units of pressure that describes a force over a given area. But the, the barometric pressure is so very important, right? To look at the barometer and see if that pressure is rising or falling. Generally, when the pressure is falling, you have lower pressure moving in. And that's typically associated with stormy weather. Whereas if the barometer, if you look at the, the, dial, the dial or the needle on the barometer, and if it's actually rising, that's associated with higher pressure and fair weather. So I always thought it was really interesting to watch the trends in the pressure as these high and low pressure systems move through my area growing up. And I still love to look at it even today. But a barometer basically is the instrument that measures the pressure, atmospheric pressure. Um, and the standard uh, atmospheric pressure is 1,013.25 millibars. Aneroid barometers are the most common you'll see. Now, you can order these online. They're really cool. There's a lot of different designs out there as well. Um, but these are the kind that you see people put on their walls in their homes. Um, so the aneroid barometer, aneroid literally means without liquid. Um, the one in my physics class, on the other hand, was a liquid mercurial barometer. Uh, we don't really deal much with mercury if we can avoid it because it's very poisonous. Um, so if somebody were to break it and it was a glass barometer filled with mercury, it can actually cause um, a lot more problems. But anyway, aneroid barometers, no fluid. Here is what it, uh, the tube looks like for a mercurial, uh, mercury barometer with liquid in it. So um, just some of the comparisons of some of the highest recorded pressure, uh, for example, was at 1,085 millibars. Wow, over 32 inches of Mercury in this case. Um, this was in Tung Sunston, Mongolia, back in December 2001. And in the United States, our highest recorded pressure, in actually in the continental U.S. outside of Alaska, was at Mile City, Montana, December 1983, where the barometer reached an incredible 1064 millibars. Now, a strong high pressure system typically resides around 1040 millibars. And then again, the standard atmospheric pressure is at 1013.25 millibars, or 29.92 inches. Now, the lower the pressure goes on this scale, the stronger the storm system. So take a look at a deep low pressure system there, 980 millibars. And then hurricanes. Hurricanes are very effective at evacuating the mass above them. So they tend to have accelerated rising air motion, and as the stronger they get, the more the intense the storm, the lower that barometric pressure. So for example, Hurricane Katrina, 
during landfall in August 2005 along the Gulf Coast, the central barometric pressure was 920 millibars. That's, that's really, really uh, low. And then even going further down the line, the lowest recorded sea level pressure was Typhoon Tip back in October 1979, 870 millibar pressure. So you can see the wide variety of, of uh, ranges in pressure that we've seen here on Earth. Now this is the concept of that mercury barometer, a liquid barometer I was mentioning that I saw in my physics class when I was younger. So what you have is mercury in a dish at the base, and whenever the air pressure is getting higher or more dense, the molecules are packed more densely together, closely together, that pushes on the base uh, of the barometer itself, the mercury in the dish, and then that causes the fluid in the tube, that vacuum glass tube, to actually rise up and get higher up. This is an example of an aneroid barometer. Uh, again, aneroid literally meaning without liquid, no liquid involved. And so you'll see um, this is a more sophisticated one with amplifying levers and aneroid cell within it. Um, but you typically have on the glass face different uh, characteristics such as stormy, rain, uh, changes, fair weather or dry weather. And so if you look at this particular example, uh, I'm showing you a range of 980 millibars, right below the stormy word, all the way up to 1040 millibars for dry. And this needle is going to fluctuate based on the atmospheric pressure. And I actually have one here on my wall at home that is actually pretty accurate. I, I tend to watch it and compare it to the National Weather Service. Here is an actual um, special type of barometer. It's called a barograph. And it literally records the trace of pressure. It has this amplifying lever, this, uh, this paper uh, just rotates, it, it rotates around as this ink trace records the barometric pressure um, over history, over, over a time period. Now pressure readings. Um, each one of these barometers is going to have a certain sense of instrument air built within it. Um, this is caused by the surface tension itself of the mercury. If it was a mercury liquid barometer, that's, that would be the surface tension of the mercury against the glass tube itself. Now station pressure is a special type of pressure that takes into account the elevation. It's the, the barometer reading or the pressure reading at a particular location and elevation after being corrected. So your station pressure, for example, in Denver, Colorado at a mile high, right? The city is located a mile high above sea level. So that pressure reading is not going to be the same at a location such as New Orleans, where they're at sea level. And so we have these correction tables um, to um, take into account the elevation at a city such as Denver. <clears throat> so we have an even um, playing field for the pressure map for the, for, the, for the actual isobars. And I'll get into what those are here shortly. Now, altitude corrections... These are made so a barometer reading taken at one elevation can be compared with a reading taken at another. Again, that's my example between Denver at a mile high elevation over 5,000 feet above sea level compared to New Orleans, which is right at sea level. We want a common um, map to compare the pressure readings between locations. So we have to calculate the station pressure to take into account elevation. So here's an example of elevation changes and, and pressure readings. If you notice on um, the top portion of this illustration, at point A, um, 952 millibars uh, is the actual pressure reading. If you were to go up uh, on top of that hill at point A, your barometer would read 952 millibars. So we have to correct it because that location, we correct the pressure because that location is 600 meters above sea level. Now if I look at point B, I'm, I'm more in a valley in this case, so I'm only 300 meters above sea level. So again, I have to correct that pressure uh, to, to uh, have an equal comparison of station pressures. And then look at point C on the right. Uh, I am 1,100 meters above sea level at point C. And so my barometer at that elevation may read 894 millibars. So again, we want a common correction um, no matter what the elevation is. Now, we talk about barometric pressure. Um, we also have to talk about uh, the pressure on constant pressure charts in the upper air. 
Now, they're known as isobaric or constant pressure charts, as I mentioned. Um, these are constructed, these upper air charts, to show height variations along a constant pressure surface. So there are, on the upper level weather maps that sometimes I share, there are contour lines of low heights representing a lower uh, pressure area, and there's contour, high contour lines of high heights, which represent a region of higher pressure, a more expansive air column. All right, so comparing surface to upper air charts, if you look at the left, I'm showing an example of a surface weather chart. The blue H represents the area of high pressure, and the red L represents the area of low pressure. Now, high pressure is typically associated with fair weather, whereas low pressure is associated with stormy weather. Now, if I compare that same surface chart on the left, over to the upper air chart at 500 millibars, which is at about 18,000 feet above the ground, you'll notice that there is a ridge in these height contours. The heights get higher um, over the Midwestern US in association with that high pressure over Southern Illinois. And meanwhile, back to the west of that high pressure or the upper level ridge, I have an area of low surface pressure and what's known as a trough at 500 millibars or an area of lower pressure with height and higher up. Now, I talked about Newton's laws of motion last week. Now, if I take one of the major Newton's laws of motion here with the object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will remain in motion as long as no external forces apply to the object, the force exerted on the object is going to be equal, uh, is equal to its mass times the acceleration produced. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. Remember that acceleration, that is the speeding up, slowing down, or change of direction of an object. Now, we take that Newton law of motion, we apply it to the forces that influence the wind. And there's a couple of forces that influence the wind that we must talk about. So we have something that's known as pressure gradient. And pressure gradient can be either steep or gentle. Those are the two terms we use to describe the pressure gradient. Um, pressure gradient force, this is the net force that's acting on the air when there's differences in horizontal air pressure. So for example, pressure gradient force is a force that's going to exist between an area of higher pressure and an area of lower pressure. And it's always going to be directed from higher toward lower pressure and it's going to be directed at right angles to what's known as the isobars, or lines of equal pressure. And I'll show you uh, an example of that. So why does the wind blow? Well, first of all, the sun gets everything in motion uh, through its heating. Once the sun heats the Earth's surface, uh, we have areas that are heated more efficiently than other areas. So we'll have air that rises over those more heated areas. Um, so air is basically rising and sinking in the atmosphere. So if I look at tank A versus tank B here and see how they have a tube that connects both of them there, we have higher pressure uh, in tank A and we have lower pressure in tank B. So if I were to take into account the pressure gradient force, it's always going to be directed from the high pressure, see where the H is located, toward the area of lower pressure, that black L at the bottom of tank B. So higher toward lower and this is the pressure gradient force. Looking at a weather chart itself, if I was looking at a surface weather chart, and I have an area of higher pressure represented by the blue H on the left, an area of low pressure represented by the red L on the right, there is that net force, or that pressure gradient force, that's going to blow um, straight across from the high to low pressure. So see how that works? And so at point one, I have 1020 millibar pressure, whereas at point two, I have 1016 millibar pressure. So I have a 4 millibar pressure difference over 100 kilometers. So I'm going to show you some other forces that are involved in wind motion in general in the atmosphere. This is a simplistic view of air flowing from high to low pressure across those solid black lines which are known as isobars. Um, so everywhere along that solid black line at 1020 millibars, um, that's going to be an isobar and then that 1016 millibar dark line is also an isobar. So why does the wind blow? Well, there's pressure differences between the high and low pressure systems. And so um, when we look at a high pressure system, for example, um, the blue H in the center of this illustration, 
you see the red arrows represent the pressure gradient force. The air is basically evacuating out from the center of high pressure towards areas of low pressure. And it's doing this in all directions as indicated by the red arrows. Now look at the um, grayish black solid lines. Again, those are your lines of equal barometric pressure known as isobars. So everywhere, if I were to put a point on anywhere along the 1016 line, every location there would have 1016 millibar pressure. And you notice how the pressure gets higher and higher as you get closer to the center of the high pressure system itself. Now what happens in the atmosphere? All right, we're showing you an intense cyclone or low pressure system here off the coast of New Jersey in this example. And all these uh, wind barbs that are wrapping around the center of low pressure. Okay, um, So we have a lot of wind energy in this case. And we, you see the scale on the right there shows, you know, the conversion in speeds between miles per hour and knots. And it shows you what those different wind barbs mean as far as wind speeds. Um, so air is blowing across the isobars, those solid black lines around the low pressure system. Air is blowing from high towards the center of the low pressure here in this case. But do you notice how these wind barbs aren't oriented perfectly straight at 90 degree angle straight across these isobars? They're more at an angle as, a, as the wind blows inward towards the center of low pressure. An angle across the isobars. And this is due to the force of friction. As wind blows across the surface, it's going to turn in direction because of the force of friction. Um, you go higher up in the atmosphere, on the other hand, there is no friction as you're far well removed from land surfaces. So again, I just want you to take a note how these winds based on the orientation of the isobars, how these winds are blowing in towards low pressure in this case. Coriolis force is another force we have to consider. Uh, apparent force is caused because of the rotation of the Earth. The Earth is rotating. So with a Coriolis force, that force is going to cause the wind to basically move to the right of its intended path in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you went to the Southern Hemisphere, the Coriolis force acts to the left of the intended path of motion of the wind. Now, the stronger the wind, the greater the deflection is going to be. So if we have a very strong mid-latitude storm or cyclone, like a really intense nor'easter off the east coast in the winter, the stronger that wind speed, the greater the deflection um, because of Coriolis force. Now, there's a zero value of Coriolis force at the equator, and it reaches a maximum value at the polar areas. And this is why, at the equator, you cannot get a tropical cyclone to develop because you just don't have that spin, the spinning motion caused by the Coriolis force because the value is zero there. Now, the amount of deflection is going to depend also on the Earth's rotation, the latitude, as well as object speed. Um, with latitude in particular, uh, you'll notice that, especially in wintertime, as a storm moves poleward or towards a northerly direction, whether it be northeasterly or northerly, you'll notice that the um, if you look at a weather satellite image, that the clouds tend to spin around cyclonically much more quickly as the storm moves to the north. And that's mainly due to the uh, effects of the Coriolis force. Now, the Coriolis force is going to act at right angles to the wind itself. All right, so if I'm looking at a merry-go-round and there's two, there's two people on this merry-go-round spinning around, okay? If you look at the upper left portion, merry-go-round is not moving. And they're just tossing this green ball back and forth to each other, okay? If you were looking from above at that same merry-go-round where in the upper left-hand portion, yeah, it would look like the ball's moving in a straight line. But if I spin that merry-go-round to the counterclockwise, uh, on the upper right-hand portion of the graphic, you'll notice that as the person throws the ball towards the other person, the blue arrow represents the Coriolis force, how that ball, if you're viewing from above, tends to move to the right of the intended path, which was the other person. So you have a, a rotating versus a non-rotating platform, and Coriolis force is going to cause that ball to move to the right of its intended path. Now, with the wind, why does the wind blow again? If we look at the globe, all right, if you're flying in an airplane uh, on the left uh, along those uh, parallels of latitude, 
uh, you'll notice the difference in distance. So for example, if you're in northern Canada on that graphic on the left, um, it's a much shorter distance because the circumference of the Earth decreases as you move toward the North Pole. But look how much more distance represented by the yellow arrow the plane has to cover down along the equator, for example. Um, so there's a big difference in distance. It's due to the circumference of the Earth. The Earth is much, has a much greater circumference at the equator as compared to the higher latitude areas, especially as you get closer and closer to the North Pole. Now, with a spinning, rotating Earth, you're going to have deviations in the aircraft's path. That's shown on the graphic on the right, the globe on the right, showing how, you know, with the Earth taking into account the, the motion of the plane and the rotation of the Earth counterclockwise, this dark orange arrow, that yellowish orange arrow, arrow represents the deflection of the plane, which appears to be to the right of its intended motion. And one other thing to note is the deflection or the Coriolis force is much greater at the, the um, farthest north point of the plane flying. All right, so straight line flow aloft. What, what are we talking about when we talk about that? As I mentioned earlier, there's no friction the higher up above the ground you get. Um, there's no land, you're well above the surface of the earth. So we call the geostrophic wind it can be estimated directly by observing the orientation of the isobars uh, or those height contours on an upper level chart. Now when the flow of air is considered geostrophic, this means the height contours are straight and evenly spaced and the wind speed is fairly constant. Now geostrophic wind is going to blow parallel to the height contours. Again, we have no friction higher up in the atmosphere. So here's an example now of the different forces acting on an air parcel. As we move, as we move basically from uh, point 0.1 to point 0.5, and you'll notice the pressure gradient force is always going to be directed by the red arrow. That's a pressure gradient force, always directed from high toward lower pressure or higher toward lower heights. If we're on the upper air charts, notice the Coriolis force is represented by the blue arrows. That's represented by the initial CF. And it's always going to act to the right of the parcel's path of motion. Now, we get a geostrophic wind when both the pressure gradient force and this Coriolis force are acting equal and opposite to each other. So at point 0.5, we have a truly geostrophic wind at which there's balance between the pressure gradient force directed from high toward lower heights and the Coriolis force directed towards to the right of the intended path of the, the parcel's motion. And so what happens is we have the winds that blow parallel to the height contours when we reach that geostrophic wind. Looking at a stream and comparing it to the atmosphere, if I look at these height contours, the solid black lines on the right, this upper level chart, it's very similar to a stream. Um, so you'll notice on the, the, the image of the stream on the left how the water is, is moving much slower. There's a slower flow of the water, the wider that stream is. But if I narrow down the stream, now my um, water is going to move much quicker or faster as I narrow the stream, the, the surface area of the stream in. And so the upper level chart, the wind works the same way. At point one, you have perfect geostrophic flow where you have the pressure gradient force or height gradient force being balanced by the centrifugal force acting in equal and opposite directions. And then by at point two, that air parcel is entering an accelerated area similar to the stream. So you notice how the dark lines, those height contours are getting closer together on the graphic on the right. And that's going to cause an acceleration of that wind. Similar to the stream, uh, the water moving much quickly, much more quickly, the narrower the stream. And so what happens is the atmosphere has to reestablish that equilibrium, get back to that geostrophic wind where the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force are equal and opposite to each other once again. All right, so we have shown an example here of more of straight line flow. But what happens in the atmosphere is you have these huge ridges and these very deep troughs and you get parcels that move around curved flow and so in the atmosphere, we just don't have straight line flow very often. 
Um, for curved winds around lows and highs, a loft. For cyclonic, we have a counterclockwise flow of air around a low, upper low, and we have an anticyclonic or clockwise flow of air around a high. Now the easy way to remember this, when I talk about clockwise versus counterclockwise, think about the hands of a clock. So clockwise is going to have a flow of air that is going to basically follow the hands of the clock, whereas counterclockwise is going to go against the normal flow of the hands of the clock. A gradient wind, we talk about curved winds and flow around curved um, height contours. This gradient wind is a wind that blows at a constant speed and it blows parallel to curved isobars above the level of frictional influence. So if I looked at gradient winds in this case, now we're talking about curved flow. We're not talking about the straight line flow here that we had, okay? Now we're talking about gradient winds and what happens is, if you look at the graphic on the left, we have an upper level low, pre uh, low height. And initially we have the pressure gradient force is acting inward towards the center of the upper low, whereas Coriolis force is acting outward to the right of the motion of the air parcel. So you see how the air parcel at one comes in to the curved flow around that upper low. So at point two, we have perfect balance because we're still fairly much in straight line flow. But as soon as we start curving, uh, counterclockwise around the upper low at points three and four, now we may temporarily have a case where the Coriolis force is stronger than the pressure gradient force. And eventually what happens is, uh, letter C there in the far upper right, you'll notice that the purple arrows represent the flow of the air parcel, but you notice how the Coriolis force and the um, pressure gradient force or height gradient force are equal and opposite to one another once again. So winds in the upper level charts, they tend to be parallel to contour lines. They tend to flow west to east and the heights are going to decrease from north to south. Um, additionally, we have surface winds. The winds are gonna generally at the surface cross the isobars at about 30 degree, at a 30 degree angle um, as well. And that's due to friction. The friction is reducing the wind speed as well as turning those winds 30 degrees across the isobars or lines of equal pressure. And then uh, just showing you, uh, again, an upper level chart here, uh, showing you a 500 millibar chart and uh, the flow of the uh, winds, the height contours are oriented in more of a trough, uh, more of a trough configuration along the west coast of the U.S. in this example, and more of a straight line flow towards the eastern U.S. And the, the dashed red lines, the maroon color there, indicates lines of equal temperature, which are known as isotherms. And um, generally troughs, upper level troughs, are associated with the colder temperatures, and upper level ridges are associated with the warmer temperatures. If we were to look at a height contour and isotherm chart. All right, so winds and vertical air motions. Air is going to move inward toward the center of a low pressure area. And as it does, as this wind moves inward towards the center of the low pressure system, the air converges, it comes together, and it cannot go into the ground. So eventually what happens as this air, these different air streams meet in the, towards the center of low pressure, the air rises in the vertical above the surface low. And then it begins to spread apart or what's known as divergence to compensate for the converging surface air below it. Now hydrostatic equilibrium this is a case where you have upper directed pressure gradient force in exact balance with the downward force of gravity. So for hydrostatic equilibrium, a fancy way to say the upper directed pressure gradient force is equal and opposite to the downward directed force of gravity. So there's a lot going on in the atmosphere, with not only in the horizontal, but also above the surface. So we have to look at the atmosphere in a three-dimensional aspect. Look at A, the diagram at A there, the box on the far left, and notice that we have pressure gradient force that is, is basically directed from the higher pressure toward the lower pressure, as it always is. And then you have the uh, surface wind turning 30 degrees across the uh, blue solid lines, which are your isobars, as well as we have Coriolis force, which turns the parcel's motion to the, deflects it to the right if it's a tendon path, and then we have friction, which is going to act to counter the wind speed, slow it down. 
Overall, all these forces come together um, and you eventually re uh, achieve equilibrium or balance once again. Look above, above that graphic on the far left and notice that we have a geostrophic wind where the wind aloft is paralleling your height contours above 3,000 meters, where your pressure gradient force and your Coriolis force are equal and opposite to each other. Around curve flow, around highs and lows, look at uh, the graphic there at B. Notice we have a surface low pressure area. Above a surface low pressure area, you typically have uh, upper level trough. And then around a surface high pressure system, you usually have upper level ridge supporting that surface high at uh, letter C. So winds and vertical air motions, uh, the, this is a, a actual surface chart of the pressure. The dark lines are the isobars once again. So you see a 1,012 isobar encircling the high pressure system located south of Buenos Aires. And then you get a 1,008 millibar isobar, uh, 1,004 millibar isobar, and so on. Just showing you the differences in the wind flow. Um, and then in the southern hemisphere, by the way, um, you have anticyclones which rotate counterclockwise and then cyclones, the actual circulation is clockwise around cyclones in the southern hemisphere. So it's a reverse of what we have in the northern hemisphere. For vertical air motions, this is what really creates the weather. Again, you have to look at the atmosphere in three dimension. Um, so for example, the low pressure system, the red L there at the bottom left part of the image, showing the air streams converging inward Pressure gradient force is directing the winds towards the center of low pressure. As these airstreams meet and converge, the air rises in the vertical. And above that area of low level convergence where the, the mass is accumulating, you have an area of divergence above these surface low pressure systems or storm systems. A divergence is going to result in a removal of mass and the development of clouds and most likely precipitation. On the other hand, when you have upper level convergence, so you have this area of air coming together at higher altitude. As the air meets, it's got to go somewhere. So it sinks, and it sinks down to the Earth's surface, and it spreads out. And that's known as divergence. So surface low pressure systems are associated with low level convergence, whereas surface high pressure systems are, low, are associated with low level divergence. So determining wind direction and speed now, moving into this topic, Wind is going to be characterized by direction, speed, and gustiness. Uh, your TV meteorologist, again, may show you, hey, the wind today is from the northeast uh, at 10 to 15 miles per hour. That's your speed. But there are gusts above 20 miles per hour. And that's exactly what the meteorologist uses to tell you how the wind is for that particular day. Describes it in the term of the, the direction, which from, the, from where it's coming from, the speed, as well as that gustiness. So wind direction describes the direction from which the wind is blowing from. And, you know, we can use terms such as onshore wind flow if you're located along a, a major body of water. Offshore wind flow is going to blow from land toward water. Then you have upslope flow in mountainous areas where your slopes heat up much more efficiently during the day. And you have a, uh, a breeze that blows up, a wind that blows up the mountain slope at night. The mountain tops cool much quicker than the lower valley, and then you get these downslope winds. And so we can use a number of terms to describe the wind. Now here's an example of, again, onshore wind. It's basically a wind that blows from the water towards the land. And this typically happens during the summertime with something known as a sea breeze, where the land heats up much more intensely, and the air rises much higher, and rises vertically over the land and the cooler breeze comes in off the water to replace the rising air. That's known as an onshore wind. An offshore wind would be an example of a land breeze at night when the land cools much more quicker than the nearby area. The land's cooling much more quicker than the nearby water, and so you get an offshore wind. Determining wind direction and speed, uh, we like to use this uh, wind rose uh, generally, a wind from 360 degrees is from the north. A wind from 090 degrees is from the east. A wind from 180 degrees is from the south. And a wind from 270 degrees is from the west. So you see all the different, you know, compass from 0 to 360, this compass rose or this wind rose shows you the directions that are associated with the different compass degree points. And so typically in the summertime, we see a lot of winds that come from the 225 degree area of this um, compass. 
Um, from the southwest, we get a lot of southwesterly winds in the summertime on the east coast. In the wintertime, we get a mix uh, of from the northwest, from 315 to 320 degrees, a lot more from the north, 360 degrees, as well as from the northeast at 045 degrees. So the influence of prevailing winds. Prevailing winds are going to be um, the wind direction that's most often observed uh, during a given time period at a location. And these prevailing winds can greatly affect the climate of a region. So for example, with upslope winds, if you lived in a mountainous area, upslope winds would result in rising, cooling air, which makes clouds and fog higher towards the top of the mountain, and sometimes precipitation too. As compared to downslope winds, as the air sinks, it's going to dry out, and you'll have much less in the way of clouds, fog, and precipitation in that case. This is an example of uh, trees being bent because of a prevailing wind direction and speed. This is more constant direction and speed at a specific location. You notice how the trees are bent from the left to the right in this, in this picture. Um, now, some of the more persistent winds on the Earth's globe happen to be uh, over the trade wind belt, where you have uh, easterly trade winds. And so in the northern hemisphere, those easterly trade winds blow from the northeast, whereas um, the southeasterly trade winds in the southern hemisphere blow from the southeast. So uh, I was living in Hawaii at one point, and the winds never really change direction. Uh, they're very persistent from the northeast in that, that uh, easterly trade wind belt. Uh, if you went up to the polar areas north of 60 degrees latitude, you would also have what's known as polar easterlies, where once again those winds are predominantly from the east. We live in the prevailing westerly wind belt, where we see um, prevailing westerly winds, but we do get a lot of different wind directions uh, in the middle latitudes, depending on the uh, pressure systems that are moving in and out of our area. So determining wind direction and speed, how do we do it? We do it through the use of wind instruments, such as a wind vane, an anemometer, uh, something known as an aerovane, a raw wind sound, wind soundings, we have wind profilers, as well as radar, Doppler radar detects um, the velocity of, of the droplets as they're moving within that radar coverage. And then we also have satellite imagery. I can tell by looking at a, a animated or looped satellite image uh, the direction of the low level winds, for example. Here is an example of some wind instruments. You'll notice the cups, uh, those are associated with the anemometer, which measure the wind speed, and then the, 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 the um, wind vane on the bottom right of this graphic uh, that's going to point into the direction from which the wind is coming. So these, the wind vane is going to be able to pivot depending on the wind direction for the day. And again, the cups, those are our anemometer which measure the wind speed. Here is an example of something known as, uh, I think it's aero vane is what it's called. Anyway, this does both the wind direction and speed at one time. So we notice how we have two different sensors. Um, a wind vane and the anemometer cups on this one, well, it's all built into one here on this particular instrument to measure the wind direction and speed. Now, this is going to pivot into the direction from which the wind is blowing, and it's, the blades are going to spin, and it's going to send the reading back down to an actual readout of wind direction and speed for this location. Here's an example of another instrument showing uh, wind direction and speed. And then if I look at satellite imagery, um, this is an example of an intense cyclone. This appears to me like this is going to be in the southern hemisphere because the winds are, uh, circulation is clockwise around this. This looks like a tropical cyclone in the southern hemisphere, actually. And you'll notice that um, just by using um, some of the satellite technology, weather satellite technology we have, we can actually garner um, the wind speed scatterometry, we can actually get the wind speed uh, and direction over the ocean areas. So in summary, aloft or above the ground where there's horizontal variations in temperature, there's a corresponding horizontal change in surface pressure. Once the air is set into motion, the Coriolis force is going to bend the moving air. It's going to deflect that air to the right of its intended path in the northern hemisphere it would do it to the left in the southern hemisphere. Now the interaction of the forces, um, whether it's Coriolis force, pressure gradient force, um, any of these forces, friction, 
Interaction of these forces is because it caused the wind to blow in different directions. There's various methods and instruments that are used to measure the wind speed and direction as well. And we looked at some of them here. All right, that wraps things up for the weather lesson today on wind and pressure. Um, again, I wanted to just kind of briefly, we covered a lot of material today, but in general, uh, we talked about the cause of winds. The winds are caused uh, mainly by solar heating and the fact that we have diff different heating properties between land and water, for example, um, as well as the winds are caused by differences in horizontal pressure. Really, that's what it comes down to. Surface high and surface low pressure systems, air is always going to be directed. Pressure gradient force is always going to be directed from high toward lower pressure. Remember that. And whether we're at the surface or whether we're aloft, okay? It depends on what's going on aloft. Do we have more of a straight line zonal wind regime or do we have curved flow? Curved flow is known as a gradient wind, whereas the straight line flow is geostrophic wind. I wanted to go through this one more time and just show, again, there's a lot of forces involved when we talk about surface wind. Because as the wind blows over the land mass, um, there, is a change, it's slow, the wind speed slowed down and there's a change in wind direction due to the force of friction as that wind moves, moves across the surface. And so we have pressure gradient force again, it's always gonna be direct from high to low pressure. Coriolis force is going to cause the motion of the parcel to move to the right of its intended path. And then we've got uh, the force of friction as well. Um, so friction is going to cause the wind to basically blow across the isobars or lines of equal pressure at a 30 degree angle. Higher up, we have more, uh, we have no frictional effects, so it's a little bit easier to get into more of a geostrophic wind where the winds are blowing parallel to the height contours. And remember this as well, very important from today's training, that the atmosphere is three dimensional. You, know, you might see a surface weather map by your meteorolog TV meteorologist at night on the news, but just realize that above that area of low pressure, there's an area of divergence where the air is spreading apart. And this is all interconnected from the surface all the way up to 300 millibars, where 30,000 feet where that jet stream is located. And some of the strongest, most intense storms have a, a very efficient vertical circulation from the surface with rising air all the way up to the upper levels of the atmosphere where you get um, air to spread apart and the removal of mass and get really intense storm systems. On the other hand, when you get really nice high pressure, these high pressure systems are associated with sinking air motion, and sinking air motion is associated with drying out the air, and that's going to result in fair weather with high pressure systems. All right, that wraps things up today at Spot On Weather. Thank you so much for listening to and watching this video. Um, really appreciate you subscribing to the channel, and if we're not spot on, we're not doing it right, we'll continue the training series next week with a new topic. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody. I wish everybody a great Friday. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there this weekend. Take care. God bless everybody.